content with uh, a land acknowledgement. So CCA uh, campuses are located on the uh, Huichin and Yelemu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, on the unceded territories of Chichenyo and Ramatush Ohlone peoples. Um, I'll post a ch uh, link in the chat to uh, give you more resources to further educate yourself about the land acknowledgement, as well as ways to support the indigenous communities within the Bay Area. CCA condemns racism, injustice, and violence toward queer, trans, black, indigenous, and people of color. We stand against all forms of anti-Asian discrimination and violence, particularly those uh, forms on the rise in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Xenophobia has no place in our community. With that said, uh, my name is Nelson Chan. I am an assistant professor uh, in the photography program and the graduate uh, fine arts program. I see some of my colleagues, Aspen Mays, our chair, Christopher Johnson, um, hopefully some other of our faculty members are here as well. Allison Smith, thank you so much for being here. Um, our Dean of the Fine Arts. Um, so this is going to be a moment to sort of celebrate our students, um, to spend time with them and to listen to what they've been doing um, during this extraordinarily crazy year. <laughs> so um, we also have uh, wonderful, wonderful guests. So we have two uh, esteemed respondents, um, Kamanse. Kamanse received an MFA from Yale University and a BA from Bard College. She has exhibited her work at Parasite in Hong Kong, the Silver Eye Center of Photography in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the New York Public Library and Aperture Foundation in New York City. Awards and fellowships include the Robert Gerard Fellowship, Aperture Portfolio Prize, Aaron Siskin Fellowship, and a residency at Lightwork. Curatorial projects include Daybreak, co-curated by Matt Jensen at Leslie Lohman Museum, and Unruly Visions, an exhibition of emerging LGBT photographers in Hong Kong, which opens this month as part of the Hong Kong International Photography Festival. Her monograph, Narrow Distances, was published in 2018 by Candor Arts. Kamanse is an assistant professor and associate director of undergrad photography at Parsons School of Design in New York City. We also have Shana Lopes, a proud San Francisco native, um, rare these days, I hear, <laughs> as an assistant curator, or is an assistant curator of photography at SF MoMA. Since her arrival at the museum in 2019, she's organized exhibitions on Sinotypes and Wright Morris and currently working on a show pairing new acquisitions with historical work from the collection. Over the past decade, she has gained curatorial experience at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. She holds a PhD in art history from Rutgers University, my home state of New Jersey, so awesome. <laughs> uh, so I'd like you to um, meet Dexter Pan, Jasmine Wolford Jones, Icy Kong, and Morgan Guerra. I'm going to, um, I'm not going to introduce them because they all had wonderful introductions uh, of their own. So I will, um, I'll get started by playing uh, Dexter's video and um, hopefully he can uh, answer some questions if your internet is working. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to share my screen. So please bear with me. Do you love pigs? I do. I always wanted to have one. Um, as a pet. But I knew for sure that I only love the small ones. But they all gonna grow someday. So I made a virtual one just for fun last year. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Chen Jinpan. I go by Dexter in life. But when it comes to work publication, I go by Sinistra. 
I was born in Tatsun City, a city next to Kazakhstan in Xinjiang, China. When I reached school age, I moved to the east side China. I've been studying in the United States since 2015. I was studying language first at St. Joseph University. I currently study at California College of the Arts. My major is photography, a minor in computation and practice. Once wanted to be landscape and street photographer. Here are some of my previous work in 2018. However, this all changed after I read recall from Henry Cartier Bresson. The world is going to pieces, and the people like Adams and the Weston are photographing rocks. This from my interest back to human society. My current work explores conflicting ideas in politics, history, and social values. Speaking of politics, I was really inspired by um, Zhou Xiaozuzhou, a rock star. He really inspired me in a way of dealing with politic topics. This is an album that Zhou Xiaozuzhou made for Every Way. This image was taken in 2009. When Zhou Xiaozuzhou and Ai Weiwei travel to Sichuan to investigate the two death number in the Wenchuan earthquake, a policeman broke into their hotel and hit Ai Weiwei's brain. Ai Weiwei took his photo while taking elevator with the policeman. As a descender, I will always criticize Chinese authority. His name has a long be bended. And he kind of lost the window to his most important items. On the other hand, Zhou Xiao Zhuzhou is at a much better um, situation. His work maintained discussions on political issues, but still survived in the Chinese market, while many of his friends, such as Ai Weiwei and Chen Shen, are officially banned in China. The trick to it is that he never like set direct conflict with the Chinese authority. Because of the media control in China, direct conflicts or criticism of any political issues um, could be um, dangerous things for artists to do. This is kind of what I learned from him, and you can see the impact um, of this statement in my work. A work or artist need to live to influence. My recent work, especially the show today, is about surveillance. Surveillance is actually a sensitive topic for me, especially in an era that a wire inside of a mask could be recognized as a 5G um, cable. In order to better discuss this topic, I made this uh, exhibition. And I would try to avoid um, any region topics to better the, the audience think about their relationship with the civilians. Welcome to my thesis show.
the show is called Safe in Binary. Safe in Binary explores what I call surveillance violence. As a photographer, I noticed the aggressiveness of the lens when pointed at people. People did not realize the sickness of being watched until the CCTV and AI technology had become the major play of the digital generation. By passing the security gate, you will see my first work, SafeLine. SafeLine is an interactive program. The camera on the screen will move with the position of the person. If you ever want to play with it, you can simply click uh, the work and you will show the link to my website. Once you are on my website, on the SafeLine page, try to move your head to the right. Like I'm doing right now. If this work is shown in a physical space, there will be a physical camera doing the same job as well. Continue walking to the left. You will see three monitors in the front. Live webcams of three different um, places is shown and accompanied by operation of the object detection program. I'm using video for demonstration. And many countries and regions have begun to use um, similar programs like this. Those AI programs could measure so whether someone is walking normally or stalking someone. It will also detect the clothes worn by passengers such as hats, masks, or glasses, as well as the things they carry such as suitcase or dangerous items they are likely to use um, in crime. The word for digits is just repeating the spelling of the word safe in a binary code. Next to the wall, there are two sets of works on this word. They reflect a problem that almost all software developers collect unnecessary user data, such as using time and interests in a justification of two better served customers. Part of this work is influenced by a documentary called The Social Dilemma. The documentary reveals the betrayal of users by internet companies. The next thing is name surrender. It's simply a transparent acrylic board um, accompanied by a green frame marked person detection. This is for audience to take selfie and post on social networks. It addresses the fact that we are actually exposing our privacy ourselves. Continue to write. The monitor will run a real time object detection program for the audience to be part of this show. At the end of the show, you will see a crime watcher. And this watcher is actually a simple image and nothing special about it. But because of those previous experiences, you might think that you are still being observed by the watcher. This is also the meaning of monitoring, so that you will eventually become your own monitor. The exit of the show is a camera filled elevator. Once a person is detected, it flashes. Due to the limitation of our steps, here I'm using flash sound effect. The flash sound effect will be played when you click the elevator. Thank you for coming to my show today. I will Okay, so um, hopefully Dexter, you're still around. I see you. So. Um, if we can maybe um, have you field some questions, that would be wonderful.
Could I begin? Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, please. Um, thank you, Dexter. One, for going first. I know that it's scary to be the first one. Um, and two, I think that your work is very uh, apropos our moment. Um, I think the way you, you, you engage with technology and the culture of surveillance, the heavy culture of surveillance at this moment is really interesting. Um, and just because I'm an art historian, uh, I, I just wanna start with um, a couple of uh, people that I hope that you're aware of, or if you're not, that you should go get, um, look, look them up. Um, Emily Jasir, uh, Trevor Paglin, uh, Paglin and um, a book by Sandra Phillips called Exposed. Um, and it's about surveillance photography, the history of surveillance photography, um, because you're working in a, a tradition um, since surveillance has been part of um, the medium's history uh, since the mid 19th century. Um, and so, yeah, and because your, your, your work is so focused thematically on it, I think it's really helpful to, to understand the history behind it. Um, one question that I have is, about your pig video that you started with, um, because you you gave a quote from uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson that talked about photographing, you know, why are atoms photographing? Why is atoms photographing rocks? Um, and uh, when like there's so much stuff happening out, and it's interesting. Then you started with a pig video. Can you talk to me about or talk to us a little bit about that video and why you decided to show it first? Yeah, I just thought that was like that was fun to play with. Uh, it was not just a video; it was an actual program. Because um, my minor is computational practice, I thought um, that would be something that people could like get sense of it um, at the beginning. Because uh, the show, our uh, many of uh, the exhibit exhibits are made of codes, and the coding is uh, related to um the show as well so i think i'm gonna sort of continue the line of question that dana posed with the pig because i think it, it really it really stood out to me as well because there, there really was um sorry come on um you're very very faint um Can you hear me now? Totally. Yeah. I, I was saying. Um, I'm oh gonna... no! Sorry, it's it went back. <laughs> I'm gonna. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank yeah. you. Continue the train of thought or line of thought of questioning about not to ask more about the pig video um, that Sheena started out with because it's really striking because that just the way you opened, it was really, you know, seeing the work ahead of time in the PDF and, and then the, the entire presentation, there's um, there's a little bit of like whimsy and humor in, in that work that the, the tone of it feels, you know, even though you're using coding and it is interactive, um, just even when the mouse, like the user's mouse sort of pokes around and then the, the pig like, like kind of moves a little bit, um, so I'm, I'm I'm just curious I'm just curious to hear like the thought behind that piece and if that's like part of the larger project or is it was it just sort of more of like a a way to introduce a whole you know I would say like um when I was creating that work uh, I did not think of things about um too deep I was simply just um love into I mean, super into pigs. And the program, I suppose, uh, I did not record a song while I was playing that. Or you like um, use mouse, the mouse to play with a note, a pig's note, you will actually release the honk song that pigs make. Um, I don't know, I thought, I thought that was uh, pleasing for me. Okay. I, I'm, I'm also going to open with a couple of references as well. Um, there's a book called The Right to Look by Nicholas, Nicholas Murzov um, that um, really talks about, you know, even the idea of um, the talks about the 
the right to the surveillance, right? And even the notion of to oversee, right? Overseer, right? And there's another book um, that's uh, that he wrote afterwards called um, How to See the World. So I would, I would recommend his text. Um, there's also a film that just came out, I think a couple of weeks ago called Coded Bias. Um, I think Joy Bulliami is, is part of that project as well, um, who's at MIT through the Algorithm of Justice, Justice League. So in terms of surveillance and now, you know, many countries are using it, um, but also the sort of, you know, the bias that comes with um, even sort of how one person is sort of registers as either criminal or not, you know. Dexter, I also, I just want to sort of jump in and say, I'm sorry, come on, did I cut you off? No, chance? go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I wanted to say that the three panels of the sort of, um, the sort of almost CCTV traffic um, cameras, that um, you were just developing that actually just a week and a half ago. Um, and I really think that that's a fantastic, um, a fantastic way that you decided to, to, um, to get that idea across because it's, beautiful being able to see all three of them move in concert, but also it's quite ominous as well, thinking that you could be one of the people in that crowd. So um, I know that that was something that you were really trying to do, kind of maybe create something beautiful, but yet also introduce this sense of anxiety. And I think that, um, I think that that was a really great success. Can you actually talk a little bit more about that work? It was, it was fascinating to look at. I was wondering, is it possible to show that one or is or not at all right now? Uh, excuse me, which one? The the one with the three the panels. The yeah. with the, the moving videos of the people on the cars. And I think there's some people crossing the street. Yeah, cool. I would try if I can um share the or on just my network. <laughs> Very good. If not, there's one of them, or there's a car scene. There's there's a scene in Tokyo, and then there's also a scene in Duffy Square in Times Square, right? Yeah. Hi, Dexter. In the in the meantime, while you're um searching for that image, I just want to congratulate you, and I want to recommend that you look at the work of uh, Shilpa Gupta. Um, could you please uh, type that in the chat? Because uh, of uh, course, <laughs> of course, and check out uh, the MIT Media Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yeah, Dexter, did you see the screen that I had shared? No. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll share the screen real quick. Oh, you got it. Yes, that exactly. What what's happening? Can you talk to me about what's the color codes and? So uh, it's basically um, object uh, detection um, programs that detect uh, whether the, there's a person or anything in their um, frame. Uh, it's based on uh, machine learning tech no, uh, Tech um, has been raised in 2000, 2005, and largely used after 2015. That when someone create a program that you can just put like different stuff in, and that the machine or server to sort of analyze what's different, why that's a person, what it make he as a car, and by like developing that um, program, they are uh, essentially like uh, arrive at a state that they can like identify which one is you, which one, you know, the one where who wear like top white shirt and brown um, pants and when he works on the street and uh, by connecting multiple, multiple like uh, CCTV cameras, they are be able to check um, the guy down, and the by like if you inject like videos about um, thieves, about how they steal 
like steal steal things and put those um, data as input into on uh, this um, uh, program, they will be able to know whether there will be thieves in the frame in the future. And uh, to you can set an arm about that. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I love the way this toes the line almost like with like technological abstraction, there's something very beautiful about it, but also very disturbing um, when you look too closely and see percentages around people and cars and you're trying to figure out what that means. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very complex and I actually, I really think it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, so I think we're gonna end Dexter on there, uh, if that's okay. Um, we went a little bit over time. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Um, and next we have Jasmine. Hi. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, do you see uh, BFA um, and intro scene? Okay, great. Do you see me changing the um, the, the slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, hi. Uh, today I'm gonna to be going over my relationship with photography, um, how it started all the way in high school and um, my influences, what I'm currently watching and reading and what I'm also making for my senior thesis. So who am I? What am I doing? What's going on here? Um, my name is Jasmine Wofford Jones. I am an Oakland native. Um, I went to high school at Bishop O'Dowd and that's where I discovered photography for the first time uh, besides taking photos on my phone. I met my first mentor, uh, Nana Kofinanti. He is a co-owner of 510 Media Commercial uh, Studio. And it was there where I gained a sense of community. And um, I was able to learn about how to use a camera, learn about lighting, um, and be a part of a group of people who are artists like myself and really get a sense of belonging in that class. It was um, really inspiring as I was going through high school. And to my surprise, um, those that group of people in this class um, pitched in money and uh, bought me my first digital camera. Um, because at the time I was just a high school student. So photography for me isn't just about taking photos. It's about connecting and building relationships with other people. So, that understanding, I then went into California College of the Arts, and that's where um, I studied with Christopher Johnson, where I learned um, how to develop my uh, black and white uh, film and uh, developing and printing it in the dark room. And it was just, it was just a great experience, um, like staying up, being in the dark room past midnight, figuring out like, okay, to get that right print. It, it really taught me how to just uh, pursue my craft on despite the challenges. And through that, I learned through Monica, she influenced me because I learned about cyanotypes in her class. And uh, it's really important because nowadays, as you can see behind me, I make a lot of cyanotypes. Uh, so that was just a huge discovery for me and um, later, in my uh, career at CCA, that's when I started um, doing more research and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Aspen um, was highly influential because she helped me understand the materiality. And I'm bringing all this up because you'll see in my work that um, there you can tell, there's, there's so much to tell besides taking a photo you can tell a compelling story, an interesting story, just on the physicality of the work, of the object. And it was through her class where I was learning sequencing and uh, bookmaking and um, 
learning on how to create a, a narrative through photos uh, that it pushed me to start making work by hand. Um, as I was going to CCA and being stuck in the library, just learning and being lost in books, I discovered Roy Dekarava uh, and fell in love with the way he uses shadows and the way he uh, tells stories through shadows and how he's a master of his craft. It was just truly inspiring to see his images. And when I went to SF MoMA, going in the back and reading the, uh, the um, the Sweet Fly Paper of Life by Roy DeCarava and Langston Hughes. I read that book and was tearing up because it was just so inspiring for me. And alongside of that, Carrie Mae Weems allowed me to get a deeper understanding of uh, American icons, of stereotypes in America behind um, the African-American culture. And I started to, I found myself doing more research on uh, foods and of uh, my African-American uh, upbringing and how blue uh, relates to music that I listen to, jazz and blues, and how that color alone uh, signifies a lot of my uh, uh, Black culture. And I wanted to take that and start making artwork with those themes. So what I'm currently doing in read, well, I'm currently watching and reading is the undoing on uh, HBO. Light blue uh, desire, you might hear my um, family in the background. Um, and uh, Wench by Dolan Perkins Valdez. Um, another thing that I'm doing is, so going back to a manual for color, uh, it allowed me to understand that the color blue alone has so many different definitions and so many different ways of expression, depending on the uh, language that you speak, depending on the cultural background, depending on where, wherever you are in the world. And I'm taking that, learning about the color blue, looking at my history in Wench by Dolan P uh, Pickersons and um, how watermelon became a black um, symbol. So in 2019, um, I started creating cyanotypes and just exploring the fruit watermelon and exploring how that fruit, uh, how, how the color blue can, can, can change the, uh, the representation of the fruit. And I was trying to figure out like, okay, so how can, how can I use the historical and cultural connotations of watermelon from the, the history like in this country? How can I take that and remove that baggage and create like a new representation of it where you're not necessarily so focused on the stereotypes that are um, constantly in your face? And so I, I did a lot of exploration, a lot of exper experimentation in 2019 just figuring that out and also working with collard greens and being in my kitchen a lot because at the time um, I had a, a new baby and I became a mom. So being inside the home, using food, um, thinking about the nutrition values was very important to me. And I wanted to somehow integrate that into my uh, artistic practice. So now, now that we're in the uh, pandemic, a lot happened. I was working part-time, lost my job. I got laid off in March. Um, was being a mom, being an artist, and uh, also looking at the uh, political side of our country and just feeling very um, fed up and very um, upset with everything happening. And alongside of me reading a lot of uh, texts that talked about the violence around the uh, fruit, around watermelon in this country. It just felt like, um, you know, th there was a lot of changes happening in 2020. And I wanted to use the material of paper and of uh, cloth and of whatever I had in my home to tell, um, to express my uh, chaotic 
uh, situation when, when it came to uh, dealing with, um, you know, the fact that when you go to the store, there was just nothing to like pick out. There was no uh, gloves. We didn't have any masks at the time. Um, on the news, there was no ventilate ventilators. And um, I wanted to somehow express just how, um, just fragmented how um, scattered I felt dealing with the, the new transition that we all went through this year. And I wanted to do that in my work. Um, I also wanted to talk about how the American flag, uh, how that has like a new uh, represent, how the American flag represents something entirely different for me now, now that 2020 happened. And I'm questioning nowadays just what it means to be American, what it means to belong and how my other, my past relationships, you know, when, when it came to photography and building a sense of community, how I just didn't feel that in the, be, in the uh, early part of this year. And to now, like, it, it feels like our country is currently very divided. And so this piece, in this specific piece, I'm questioning what it means to be like, like what, what are we doing right now in America? And I'm, yeah, I'm just doing that currently. I'm just exploring and continuing my, continuing my um, experimentations with uh, watermelon and with uh, paper and with fabric. After graduation, I want to continue my studies with cyanotypes, but I also want to figure out how I can interweave um, my photography uh, my my uh, digital photography and my uh, film photography in there too. Um, there's a lot of photos that I've taken during this year and during CCA, but it just it, it I'm more interested in just figuring out. Um, okay, where does watermelon? Its history doesn't just stop in America. It goes all the way back to Africa. And doing that research after I graduate, I'm really interested in doing that and somehow connecting, um, continuing to connect my uh, mother, um, my relationship with being like a mom and an artist and just figuring how, out how to like mesh all those together. So thank you. It's, and I wanna also say that this collage right here, it, it, it's, it's very disorienting, but it, it explains exactly how I'm feeling and how I wanna continue figuring out the pieces of, uh, of life itself really, yeah. And how I fit into it. So thank you for listening and I'm open to taking any questions right now. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we do have just a few minutes um, for questions or comments. I just want to say that I'm so excited about that new work that you are experimenting with. It's fantastic. I, I see come on nodding. <laughs> it's really, yeah, I'm, um, thank you. That was, um, thank you for walking us through also the, the entire process. Um, and um, I, I'm really excited by the last piece that you show just because it's like, you know, it, it, it really, you know, there's so much going on in it. And like you talked about f those feelings of feeling disoriented and the fragmentation, but at the same time, there's, there's so much um, like energy in that piece. And at times it's like kinetic because it moves, but then there's like, even in COVID, like to get a glimpse of air or like the sky, the blue then becomes the sky, but then there's also blue tape that's like holding something together. And then there's moments where the cyanotype because it's fabric feels like gauze, you know, like sort of like medical holding together. And um, and then there's, so the water and the sky and then the trees and it, it, there's really just this like sudden burst that happens in that last frame. Um, I, I really enjoyed also hearing how you just talked about transforming this 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 um you know the watermelon and even like stripping out of the color and then even asking viewers to to re-question uh, what that what that symbol is um and how it holds and what to to create new meaning and create meaning out of the chaos of 2020 so just congratulations yeah thank you
Yeah. Um, Jasmine, uh, thank you for talking to us about your work. Um, I'll, I'll echo everybody else and say that last piece was stunning. Um, and you, you spoke a lot about chaos or using that word chaos and um, throughout your presentation. And I think the last work was very representative of that word, um, of the choppiness. Um, whereas I almost didn't, I didn't feel the chaoticness of, of the world in the watermelon work or the, the masks. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's because like it, maybe it, 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 it didn't feel as, um, maybe it was more scat like used also the word scattered once and that's kind of where it felt. Um, but I have to say like, I'm a sucker for cyanotypes and abstraction in photography. And so those were really fun for me to look at. And I'm, I'm definitely more, uh, I gravitated toward the watermelon ones um, most um, because yeah, we're, I'm just not sure what we're looking at. And I have to, I have to ask like, have you tried doing the watermelon in other, uh, not in cyanotypes too, just because I know on your website, uh, like you took photographs, chromogenic uh, photographs of the collard greens, right? Um, so you work obviously in other uh, media. Um, and so I'm just curious, like, yeah, how, how, how else have you experimented with watermelon? Yeah, um, I, I didn't really talk about that, that, that process. Like I, I started as, I started using a digital camera and just photographing it in my kitchen, essentially, cutting it up and uh, thinking about new ways that I could think, thinking about how I saw images of watermelon in the past, just growing up and being around it and looking at it on Google, looking at it in images, looking at it in, uh, you know, our history class and the, the stereotype, the stereotypical images I would see. And when I was in my kitchen, I really wanted to photograph it in a way that I never saw before. And so cutting it into uh, pieces that stood on top of each other, almost like building blocks um, and thinking, thinking of it as a, oh, as a thing that I'm creating, like as an architect, like I'm, like I'm building something. So I started digital, printed those, and then I started moving into cyanotypes after that. And alongside photographing uh, watermelon digitally, I was also photographing color grains. I just haven't put those images of watermelon on my website. <laughs> I wonder um, also in your artist statement, if you should talk a little bit about connection and how in the beginning of your talk you talked about how photography for you is about connection and when you do cyanotype that's kind of what I see is that connection happening between subject and paper right or fabric or whatever uh, support you're using and I think that's uh, I think that's part also of what you're doing um, by choosing to do the cyanotype or at least that's how I'm reading it um, and I'll, I'll email you or put in the chat some uh, recommendations for books that I have a, a ton of for cyanotypes and also uh, some about photographic humor in the 19th century and, uh, and race and how that, uh, especially the watermelon. Um, so I'll, I'll forward you that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we have to move on to our next um, presenter. And if, you, if anybody has any questions, again, please put it in the chat and we'll hopefully get to it um, at the end. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That was really fantastic. Um, so our next presenter is Icy Kong. Um, so take it away, Icy. Hi. Hi guys, my name is Xinyang Kong. I am a graduating senior from the photography department. Welcome to my thesis presentation. I was born in 1998 in a small city called Yangzhou in the southeast of China. I came to the US for college education in 2016. I was initially majored in fashion during, uh, during the two years. While I was a fashion student, I had my first taste of being a designer and produced, produced several collections. 
I enjoyed my time as a fashion student and was grateful to meet and work with a lot of fabulous young designers. As I have become more and more involved in art, I slowly developed strong interests towards fine art. At the time, I took several classes in photography and jewelry and metal arts and conducted multiple projects. I eventually transferred to the Department of Photography in 2018. As a working artist, I have several exhibitions. For example, last month, we collaborated with students from the Georgia State University and exhibited in SF Camera Work Gallery. It's called What is Your Voting Story? I also have several other duo or solo exhibitions in school. I didn't realize until recently, when I looked back at the artists who I admired and had great influences on me, that they are all female artists. The influence of female empowerment and the ways of looking and touching the world from a female angle have unconsciously shaped my practices of art. Linko Kawachi is the first photographer I have ever read about. It has been 10 years, but I still could not forget how much shock I felt when I saw her photos of the fireworks in the magazine. She is a true master of handling the light in her artworks. I personally believe that the most amazing and stunning elements of in her photo are the parts where the highlight is used. She mentioned in an interview once that photography is not only about capturing the scene, but also about capturing the atmosphere and the light of that moment. This has always been one of my mottos when I do my photography. Minagawa Mika is another artist who has influenced me a lot, and she is the one who led me to photography. I was, I was particularly attracted by her rich colors, which are so vibrant that I was always immediately drawn to them. I almost feel like my eyes are forced to fixate on her photos because of the colors. Actually, I, I really enjoy this aggressiveness behind her works because they are definitely masterpieces that deserve to be greatly appreciated. She has taken many pictures about flowers, both natural ones and fake ones. The, blue, the blooming flowers take up most space in the frame and the overwhelming splendor makes the audience question the, the reality. I got to know about Tracy Emming and her works during my IB visual art courses. My art teacher, Mr. Mark, showed me one of the most famous works of her, my bed. An installation piece finished in 1998. To be frank, at first, it looks like totally a mess to me. Personal belongings and the dirty laundries were all over the places. Later, I realized that it is a screenshot of her personal life and the past memories. And I was immediately fascinated by the honesty she showed to herself. Also, a lot of her works contain, uh, contain her own handwritings and express her most sensitive feelings and emotions. Her artworks remind me of being honest to myself and my art practices. Today, for my own artworks, I'm going to show two bodies of my works, the Narcissus and the stained glass window series. Both of them discuss the topic of love. Narcissus describes the love for oneself. The stained glass window series talks about how love is expressed in relationships and the definition of love from the per perspective of the public. 
The thesis is a series that captures fake flowers and their reflection in the mirror. The inspiration comes from one of my previous projects, Floral Illusions. The name Narcissus comes from the Greek mythology. It was a name of a handsome boy who fell in love with his own reflection in a pool of water. In the end of the story, he killed himself upon realizing he can, cannot have his own reflection as a lover. Then, in his place, sprouts a flower bearing his name. In this work, a mirror was, played, was placed under the water on the beach at night. Moments of reflections crushed by the waves were shot using a mono light flash as a supplement of light. The work expressed the fact that illusions are not real and will eventually fade away. At the same time, the presence of illusions is beautiful enough to be captured. In the physical exhibition, this will be large scale prints on photo paper. The, the stained glass windows is a series of artworks borrowed from the form of the traditional stained glass windows. It is my second time doing this form. The first time was in 2018 for my media history classes. I visited churches and cathedrals in San Francisco and took pictures of their architecture and interior decorations. I then filled the templates with these pictures. It was a deconstruction and a reconstruction of the traditional stained glass, stained glass windows. For well, this time, I chose to continue on this film and tell stories except the question entity. The religious meaning behind the stained glass windows was completely removed and replaced by the expression of love. Templates from the internet were downloaded and filled with found images. Reflections of love expresses the idea that love is the reflection of light between the lover's eyes. I used elements containing light and reflections, such as laser lights, gemstones, and glitters, and three neon artworks illustrating a love, love course from one of my favorite artists, Tracy Amy. Love Stories was generated by the fun photos about love. I posted on forums and, and group chats for images representing love. Each of the segments is a love story in real life. For example, a, girl, a grocery receipt of a couple for their picnic and and the lights and curtain captured by a girl who woke up beside her man. The remaining three of the pieces were created from the top 100 like photos on Instagram pulled by a programmer. Together with the three pieces of them, they are all called Ink's Love. The letter N in the bracket, in a bracket with an I and an S indicates the source of the images, Instagram. The first of the three is a general impression of love and the rest are expressing common elements of love, eye contact and honeyed words. Altogether, the main themes of this series are, are the complexity of love and how love is seen by different people. The whole series will be printed on transparency if shown in a physical gallery in order to simulate the real visual effects of the stained glass windows. My next step is to focus on bringing the projects out of the screen and exhibiting them in physical environments. For example, for the stained glass windows, I'm going to print them out on transparencies and I try to install them. One of the ideas 
is to put them onto the windows of, of my apartment. So it will look like a hidden little church in the community. Altogether, I will continue making works on visualizing human feelings and emotions and exploring boundaries of visual experiences. This is the presentation would not come into being if I had not received help from my teachers, classmates, families, and friends. They offered me so much encouragement without which I would have already given up. First of all, I would like to thank CCA Fine Arts Department, CCA Exhibition Team, and all the staff who contributed to holding BFA Senior Thesis Conversations. It is you who gave me chance and make and made me here talking about my works. I also would like to thank Shana Lopes and Kamanzi for coming to our artist talks and giving constructive critiques and advices. And thanks to all my teachers and classmates in CCA for their constant encouragement, gui guidance, and help. Finally, I would like to thank my parents and friends for their unfolding love and support. For many years, they have been all, they have always been with me and supporting me. At the very last. Special thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Lee, who helped, who helped me with the process of writing and revising this script. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, I see. So we certainly have um, a few minutes for questions and comments. I can I can go. Um, thank you, Icy, uh, and thanks for also explaining how you envision these because I think that's one of the first things as a curator and our historian. I'm trying to figure out the scale of the objects and um, and how you're th thinking about showing them. And so that's that was interesting to hear at the end um, your thoughts on that. Um, and you know I. I I have to also go back to kind of the history of stained glass and you know it was to tell stories to to let in light or, well to let in some light but also in some ways to gain privacy um, and so I think it would be useful for you to look through either northern renaissance books gothic uh, uh, art history books just like looking at how stained glass has been used because um, at a, it doesn't have to necessarily have the religious connotations, right? It's it's about telling a story, which is what we're trying to do. Um, but I also wanted to ask, or why you chose to use found imagery, and what the significance is of found imagery versus your own. Uh, actually, at the very first uh, stained glass piece I made, which is. Uh, reflections. That's one. I use some of my own pictures, but then I found that my pictures are not enough. So I start to collect photos from my friends, and then I found, okay, I'm going to go further. So I try to uh, gather the one top one hundred uh, liked photos about love on Instagram. So. Uh, I go further and further, so I, I'm trying to explore the boundaries, like how far I can go and how, uh, how many opinions or expressions from different people I can get. I'm, I'm going to sort of follow up on that question. Well, first of all, thank you. And um, I'm, I was also trying to make connections between your influences. And so like even thinking about Rudra Kawuchi's use of light and Tracy Emin and Tracy Emin sort of the sort of works around like disclosure and um, and relationships. Um, and I I was really I was really um, thinking a lot about how you were talking about how you source the images. And I think that that's there's something really interesting there that I would like you to sort of continue with. Like it felt like um a really interesting sort of way to source images where you're asking people and there's a sort of uh, approach of saying um, what is your you know how would you represent it in the couple who presented a receipt from a picnic you know 
Um, and so these kinds of ways, I think gets, for me, it gets more interesting when it's these prompts and it's this relationship um, and it's people that you're engaging with as opposed to the sourcing through Instagram. Um, I think that when you're talking about the complexity of love, like it, it is really complicated and really complex. And I wonder if perhaps the, the route of the more complicated relationships and people that you know um, might generate more complex kinds of images versus um, like a top 100 on Instagram or that kind of algorithm that happens. Um, but I would encourage you to really think that way of like working with people, asking these prompts and, or what does church mean? Or I was even thinking about like, you know, we're looking at the stained glass windows behind you and and what is the space of the church? And um, I was thinking of the Fred Moten sermon, um, This is How We Fellowship, um, from I think a year or two, or two ago, and I can send that link on, on YouTube as well. But maybe it's being expansive about how we think about a church or love or storytelling or fellowship. Thank you. Do I have one minute just to follow sure. up? Yeah. Uh, uh, just, yeah, just to go um, on what Kamon was saying, um, because using uh, sourced images from Instagram has a very different theme, right? It, it brings it into, uh, um, it brings it into like social media and like, what does that mean? And how does that, what's the relationship with social media and stained glass religion and, and all these different things versus that versus a beautiful story that you actually have connections to. Um, and I can just imagine um, reading a label about a work where you talk about like a, the receipt and whatnot. And like that to me is grabs me um, and, and sucks me in uh, and is a very different um, overarching concept than uh, an Instagram top 100. So just to yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll just say that, you know, I see it's been such a pleasure to work with you for the past uh, year and a half. And I feel like I'm just really understanding your personality and just to maybe uh, as like as like an observation, I feel like the photographs that you make have a really sort of a deep resonance that actually has this sort of darker complexity to it. And I feel like with this other work, you're trying to explore uh, it's sort of the opposite. And I feel like um, when, when we were talking about how you were sourcing the images and what they're about, um, I like seeing that sort of conflict that you have as an artist. Um, and yeah, I, I really hope that you, you, you push that even further. So thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, I'll just want to add one more thing is like Instagram, just with the algorithms that those sort of the, those dates pictures or like things that are um, aspirational performative, like get, they do get pushed to the top. Whereas like, you know, I don't see on my feed like breakup pictures, right? Um, it's not about breakups, but like um, maybe it's like finding ways to sort of source that. Yeah. Anyway, stop. Yeah, thank, no, you. thank you. All thank right. You. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Morgan Guerra. Hi, everyone. Let's see. Gosh, can anyone hear my heart beating? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just heard my roommate scream <laughs> down the hall because he's watching. Um, hi, my name is Morgan Guerra. I'm a senior in my last semester of undergrad at California College of the Arts. Today, I'll be guiding you through my influences, my past bodies of work, my recent, my recent thesis work, followed by my plans after graduation. A little bit about me. I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I grew up with two parents who always reiterated that I needed to find a career that I love so I didn't have to work a day in my life. Both of their careers are centered around mathematics and science. So naturally, when their youngest daughter expressed her passion was photography, they questioned just how many times they dropped me as a child. Just kidding, my dad's a medical professional and wouldn't do that. Um, before I came to CCA, my time in Texas was spent between two part-time jobs and marketing classes. This killed all desire for something practical. Surprisingly, my parents were supportive of my choice to study art in the Bay Area. And now I'm here talking to you and about to graduate with my bachelor's of fine arts. Having, living, having lived 21 long years in Texas, I was used to my surroundings, so when I made the move to California, I became infatuated with everything around me. 
Everything I saw was new to my eyes and I couldn't get over the fact that I was surrounded by so much natural beauty, all the while being in, living in one of the biggest tech hubs in the world. Um, I came to CSA not knowing very much about art. So in between classes, I would sit in the library and lose track of time discovering a whole new world of artists. Growing up, I only got to know my grandfather's, grandfather's through family photos. Being able to hold these memories made me fall in love with photography. As a maker, seeing the photographs of Lee Friedlander brought back these, the, these same feelings of wanting to freeze time. In addition to Brian Ulrich, his series, Dark Stores, Ghost Boxes, and Dead Malls is a body of work that I was obsessed with from the moment I saw it. Ulrich's photographs are not only beautiful, but also bring up the idea of consumerism in America, the constant desire for more and how it has, to be, and how it has become so ingrained into our daily lives, followed by a feeling of emptiness. Shizuka Yokimizo and her series, Dear Stranger, is a body of work that has been on my mind since the beginning of quarantine. In this series, she mailed anonymous letters asking ground floor apartment residents to stand in front of their windows at a specific time to photograph them. In this way, all those addressed knew that their apartments were being watched and that they were collaborating with the voyeur of sorts. Yokimizo promised to refrain from any exchange with her addressees, no knock on the door, no conversation, only two complete strangers fully complicit in the act of photography. And now I'll get into my first body of work. This body of work is meant to be viewed in a book format. So please imagine the slides as book spreads with the blank spreads operating as punctuation marks. This series was made within a five day span on the island of Kauai at the very beginning of the pandemic. Revisiting these images has brought up emotions that I wasn't aware were still present. Emotions of uncertainty surrounding my own safety or that of my family who were supposed to meet me on the island, but weren't able to due to travel restrictions. While alone on the island, I was met with many unfortunate circumstances. Heavy rain that didn't allow the plane to land for hours, rental car problems, injuring my leg and busting my camera due to a big fall. Um, talk of COVID hadn't yet reached the Hawaiian islands. However, every scene I stumbled upon seemed post-apocalyptic. As the days went on, I began to fear that I might get stranded on this island and not be able to return to San Francisco. Revisiting these images really brought back unsettled feelings from the beginning stages of the pandemic and the fear that surrounded so many of us and still does. Moving on to a new body of, or a different body of work. Um, this body of work was my last physical piece of work I was able to make and display before our citywide shelter in place was enacted. This work is a, about a lot and may seem overwhelming. The feeling of being overwhelmed is exactly what I experienced after my move to San Francisco. While out making photographs, I'm drawn to destruction and fragments, things that come from our world growing at an exponential rate. While walking around the city, I enjoy creating abstractions from mundane objects and unfortunate circumstances. I stumble across disorienting scenes of reflections that create many layers within one image. This series questions if progress is good or bad. Is there a black or white answer? I want these images to both feel daunting and disorienting and create an unsure sense of is it too late to reverse our effects on the world. As I previously stated, there was a huge contrast in moving from Texas to California. I had idealized San Francisco and all San Francisco and all the life it carried. However, once I moved to the city, I realized how much of a change these big tech corporations had impacted the city. In my class desiring technology, I began reading a book uh, titled What Technology Wants by Kevin Kelly. And I recall being very disturbed by some of his points. Kelly had a strong stance that nature was only going to be available to the most elite people within the next 20 years. Stunned as I was to read this perspective, it started to make more sense as I began to look closer at the very city I was living in. The Bay Area is one of the most expensive, expensive places to live in and is surrounded by so much nature. Kelly's words are unsettling. Moving on to my 
piece, this work uh, titled Emotional Sickness. These photographs capture the evolving spaces of mundane scenes I stumble across while also gravitating towards unordinary situations. I often have a hard time articulating my thoughts and feelings. However, when it comes to photographing, I embrace my intuition, resulting in my personal outlook on life. On March 26, 2020, like so many, I got laid off. I went from being home for just seven hours a day to being home 24. Emotional sickness is a body of work from the past 10 months. This year is filled with many emotional highs and lows, oftentimes leaving me mixed up and confused as to how to navigate this new normal. During these bleak 24 hours, I started documenting the mundane through Polaroids. While transitioning my bedroom into a workspace for Zoom University, I found myself capturing strangers' interactions from my window, which led to daydreaming about pre-COVID days. Though I continued my daily practice of making pictures in the home, I eventually gained the courage to step outside of my door and photograph again. My plans after graduation, um, after I graduate, I plan on spending time with my loved ones. After not seeing them for a year, I just want to take a breath and continue to create and capture moments with them. I have a lot of ideas for new bodies of work and have been wanting to travel from Texas to California by car while documenting desolate areas that once used to flourish with resources, but are now considered ghost towns. I think this comes from being from Texas surrounded by a bunch of oil fields. I learned about depletion from an early age but it was never talked about from a critical view. And this lack of conversation is what has drawn me to photographing scenes after human destruction. Thank you all for listening and putting up with my shaky voice. And again, thank you, Aspen, Nelson, Chris, all of CCA, all of my classmates, everyone. Thank you so much, Morgan. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, liven up the moment a little bit. Okay, let me stop sharing. Yeah, so I guess we'll open up the floor for some questions. Um, I, I can begin. Um, Morgan, your color photography is incredible. Thank I just you. wanna say. Um, so we're clear, I also looked at your website beforehand um, and you have an amazing sense of color. I, I really, Thank you. very impressive. Um, I, the the sec the second project and the third project are is do you also envision those as books? I envision so the second one the black and white um, stuff. I don't know if you're familiar, but we have a thing called test strip. So that was a physical object um, a week before we went into shelter in place, and I think I'd like for that to remain as a physical object. Um, I would love the physical to exhibition, correct? Yes, physical yeah. exhibition. Um, and I would love them to be mural print size. So like two of me, if you could see me in real life, I'm pretty short, four feet um, squares. Um, but I think the last one I would love to see is a book. I think it's a physical object and especially during the time that it was made of not being able to gather as and be in the moment and be in certain spaces. I think a book and being able to pass that book along to other people in a safe and COVID positive way um, would be my ideal situation. I asked because when you work with small Polaroids, it's it's hard to, if you do an install with, some, with something like that, it's hard to um, to put them with large prints, right? Um, it can easily, the Polaroids can easily get dwarfed depending on how they're um, installed. Um, but there's some, I think I wrote down some actually, uh, it was like Untitled 3, I Need a Haircut, um, Untitled 4 in those last um, photographs that are like, especially the chair, 
the yellow chair that you had in your home, there was something just so almost melancholic. It was sad, but also really beautiful and just intimate and um, captured it really well. Thank you. Yeah, like I was um, also really gonna say like the, just like the, the eye that you have and then like, I mean, you know, anyone who's making work right now, we, we are reading it through the lens of the, of COVID-19 and, and, and this class, like your class will be sort of marked by this, but um, there are so many moments that are, um, it's like the visuals are so expressive. There's like, like, um, like Shane had mentioned the couch and then but there are so many like looking out of the window and then there's a one where it's an empty couch with the window. It looks like a window through a window. There was like the hole in the bushes. That's a really great picture. Um, the repetition of like cars that are crumbling, like two tons of metal that are like crumbling and scratches of paint. And then like the building with all the wires coming through and you're talking about late capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about the apocalypse but you're also talking about late capitalism. And to even hear you sort of tie all that in with, you know, even like being laid off and the economy in San Francisco and the sort of the larger context of the work too um, was, just really strong. Um, uh, I, I also just also, I would encourage the book format to also be like medium and technology agnostic. Like there can be the Polaroids and then there can be the digital pictures and they can all sort of exist together. Um, and like the long lens that's happening in a lot of the pictures, like just the way you're crushing and compressing space in a really, like a, that's sort of also a feeling that we get when we're sort of quarantining and sheltering in place and that sort of claustrophobia and how things, I don't know how long the lens is like a one something or two, 200 something, like, but how that space gets compressed and how we sort of feel emotional. It's almost like the, the visuals are doing that kind of like crushing and, and like breathing um, or like crying, like all together. So just really, just really exciting work. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. The reflections in your photographs are really fun. Uh, you, like you, you can find them like throughout your your work, and um, especially that one from Kauai, the with the car reflection that was that was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, there was like a landscape within a landscape in that car picture, like just wow. And then there was a black and white vertical where like there was a crushed car in the bottom left. And then there was like, it was almost like the buildings were getting liquefied, like it was like a science fiction picture, like film, like, and it was just like crumbling and like, um, like how, how you're able to use distortion and that sort of kaleidoscopic thing. Like, and when you like showed Freelander, then it sort of like made sense, you know, but, but it, it is, you know, 2020 and yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Really exciting. And I'll just to give a little bit more context for Morgan's black and white images, that was an exhibition at, in the test strip um, gallery that we have at CCA. Uh, Morgan combined photographs and also had collected a, a, a very large amount of like wires and cables and had that as a part of the installation. And um, Morgan, I, I, I hope that you push that. I hope that you push it into like a really, really expansive physical experience because I think that there's so much potential there, um, especially in what everybody's talking about. But the fact that you're also bringing in these found objects as well is um, I think really, really powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we do have about um, like a little under 10 minutes for other questions. Um, so we can take questions from the audience. I see Monica Bravo is with us. Thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, if there are any other questions or comments, please um, feel free to chime in. Hi, so sorry to miss the presentations. I'm coming from another engagement, but I wanted to congratulate the graduating seniors. You guys, it's so exciting that you're that you're kind of reaching this culminating event. And I just, I, I guess I would ask just all of you to maybe reflect on you know, what you'll take from this experience going forward. Monica, do you mean this experience of this year or? <laughs> sure, How about this, this experience, yeah. I like unmuted myself, so I feel obligated. Um, my experience is just, I feel like 
I was constantly on the go, like I said, of going from, I live in San Francisco, would commute to Oakland. And that's where our photo program is based out of, while also working in San Francisco. So I feel like I was constantly on the go. And once I was just settled, I got to really like experience things. And the seasons were also changing when quarantine hit. So I was just really observing nature and just really appreciative of just the leaves changing or a bird coming to my window every morning. So just the small things. All right. Um, well, I know that Aspen, I'll turn it to you. I think you had a few words that you wanted to say. Oh, I just want to, thanks Nelson. I just wanted to make sure I got to say congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm so proud. I, I, you should all be really proud. You did a great job. It was so, it's, it's been such a pleasure to work with each one of you over the last few years and just felt really touched tonight to think about your resilience and perseverance and putting this and putting your work together and also just reflecting the world to us, you know, in, in this time that we're in. And it's great to look out and see um, familiar faces. Uh, thank you, Allison, for being here and Julie Caffey and Nick Janikian and Brindis and, and Jamie and all the folks that make this program what it is and make our school what it is. Nelson, you did so much work organizing this and Chris Johnson. And of course, thank you so much um, to Shana and, and Kaman for being here. And um, it's great to also see some alums out there and students and, and friends and family. So I just wanted to express lots of gratitude. Thank you. And actually, Jasmine, you have a question in the chat. So um, Eric C says, uh, your work is touching. How do you look at the world different as an African-American African photographer? Uh, yeah, I thank you for the question. I, for me, it's about, it's about identity. It's about looking at re revisiting history, using memory, using, um, as, using memory as a way to uh, translate the like history and uh, the past and connecting it to the future. I think a lot of my work has to do with identity and representing that in my own way. Um, yeah, thank you for and uh, thank you for asking that question. Jasmine, I'd also like to say that I, I think it, it might be subtle, but I think that you are doing such a profound job at reclaiming as well, like really, really taking back, because I think that that's incredibly important to recognize. Thanks, Nelson. I'm definitely trying to do that through changing the color and yeah, changing the uh, representation. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump in and, and really congratulate all four of you for this really great presentation of your work. And of course, Nelson for pulling it together. And I'm seeing the emergence of something I'm calling in my mind, the silver lining project, because, you know, having to deal with sheltering in place and putting together this format actually is very precious. I mean, I'm really appreciating the fact that, you know, we're here, we're getting to see these capstone presentations. You know, it's very organized around personal history, and yet it gives us a real sense of what you're doing as artists. So thank you as a group, and thank you, Nelson, for putting this together. And I have a feeling as if this may be a tradition that um, has legs. Yeah, I would hope so, too. Um, and yeah, just to sort of end um, on a few thank yous. I mean, thank you, everyone, for being here. And of course, this is such a crazy time, crazy year, but um, I do think that moments like this really, um, really, really, uh, you know, talk about community. Um, Shana, I just met you and you actually just moved back to the Bay recently to um, take your appointment ship at SFMOMA. Um, Kaman Se is one of my closest friends in New York City and it's so wonderful to be able to, to have you here. So um, yeah, thank you very much. It's been really, really wonderful. It was our, it, my pleasure, honestly. I, I feel really lucky to, to get to see and hear your students talk about um, their work. And this can't be easy uh, to be getting a BFA um, 
on uh, over Zoom right now. And so it, you got you manage all of you manage to get across uh, what you're hoping to do with your art. And thank you for sharing. And free, feel free to email me the four of you if you need anything or need any uh, recommendations. Um, just Nelson has my email address. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Jamie, Austin, would you, do you have any last um, announcements by chance for um, CCA exhibitions at all or? Sure, I guess I would just invite everyone. This is our first of a two part series for the BFA Senior Conversation. So we do have another event taking place next Wednesday, December 9th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And that will be featuring work by five additional graduating seniors this fall. And very soon we will be launching our fall 2020 showcase, which will feature uh, individual portfolio pages by all of our graduating students this fall. And we're just really excited to recognize the work and their capstone work that they've been able to bring to fruition uh, despite all of the odds with COVID-19. So congratulations to everyone for your great presentations and we're, you know, we really enjoyed working with you. So I would ask that maybe if everybody could unmute and we'll just give a little roaring clap for our presenters and our respondents. Yay. Awesome. Yeah, I just, I, I, um, before people leave, I also, um, hi, I'm Allison Smith, and just wanted to thank our distinguished guests. It was wonderful to have you here, and thank you to Nelson and Chris and all the, the photo faculty, and especially to um, the four artists who presented tonight. I was just so blown away by each of your presentations. I just want to thank you, and was really inspiring. Um, you know, each of you offered something I thought really special and the themes that you're taking on around, you know, surveillance and um, identity and motherhood and, you know, the pandemic and, you know, just, um, you know, just very beautiful, moving, disturbing, um, really compelling work all around and such an amazing variety. So. It's a great reflection, I think, of um, of the program and you know your time here. And um, yeah, it was just really a pleasure to to get to see your work tonight. So thank you so much. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, if there are no more last words, then um, take care. And, Bye, buddy. Uh, Be uh, well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.